For the longest time, my favorite thing to listen to while I was drawing was Nancy Reagan reading her autobiography. <laughs> because she had this, I know it sounds strange, but she had this beautiful patrician voice. Right. And uh, she was pretty good with words, and she was actually talking about historical matters that was interesting. Right. And she didn't seem to have any understanding at all of what she was actually saying, which was also kind of fascinating. So I, I loved reading or listening to that. All the way from Seattle, Jim Woodrink at the Scott Eater Gallery in Brooklyn, the opening of your new show, Weathercraft. Jim, welcome to the Dusty Wright Show. Thank you, Dusty. It's good to be here. You know, I, I have to say, um, I've admired your work from afar. You know, I've been in the comic book collector world for most of my adult life and childhood. Saw the Frank comics, would pick them up on occasion. I don't know why I gravitated to your new book. You don't know why? Well, the artwork, yeah, the subversive artwork, the elements, everything, and then I became like your biggest fan, and here yeah, we are. Yeah, great. Well, see, that wound up all right. I think it maybe I think for some people, you know, you collect certain artists or books, and you know, you get immersed in the world, and then you you don't have time. All oh, life gets in the way, and you, oh yeah, and you forget about other people like yourself, and you know, sure. I'm so happy to have stumbled into this. Well, good. I'm glad you feel that way yeah. because it was a real huge amount of work for me to draw this book, and I'm. I'm glad that you, for one, are picking up on it. Well, uh, tell me about it. Why did you gravitate towards a, uh, a non-dialogue uh, book? Well, uh, all of these Frank stories are wordless, and I chose to do them that way because I wanted to create something that was sort of outside of time and specific space, you know? When I was first uh, developing this concept, this world, I had the characters talking, and that I quickly realized I tied it to 20th century America because of the idiom of the language they were using. And so I just deep sixed that and decided to have everybody act everything out, which makes it also means that it's easier for me to produce a longer book because I can't use any shortcuts. I can't say, meanwhile, back at the bank, I have to show the people leaving where they are and going to the bank. Right. It eats up a lot of real estate on the page and it increases my page count. So uh, I figured it would be smart to do that because I would have to do less thinking and more drawing. Nice, good answer. Thank you. The Mad Magazine, I mean, that was, I'm assuming we're in the same age range, uh, that was kind of like the Bible, I guess, when you really got into subversive stuff as a young guy, and then I guess it was National Lampoon after that or around the same time period. What was it about uh, what Harvey was doing with his book? Because there was also Crack was at the same time as well. Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, you know, who can say exactly what is the nature of the magic that made Mad Magazine what it was? Partially Harvey Kurtzman, partially Bill Elder, right. partially great draftsmen like uh, Jack Davis or Wallace Wood or any of those guys. It was just a lining up of the elements in a magic way. Right. And how about the Marvel DC world? You know, I've never, ever read those comics. I read Mad Magazine when I was young, and then I had no interest in comics at all until the undergrad comics started right. coming out. So when Robert Crumb and all those yeah. guys started... Yeah. Started. Crumb, Crumb's head comics was a big right. door opening up for me. That was a, a huge revelation right there. Tell me about the Francis Ford Coppola dust jacket blurb. How did that happen? When did he see your work? I don't know exactly when he saw it. I had a friend who worked for him doing storyboards for his movies and he showed Francis my work. And then later on somebody told me that they were going out with uh, Coppola's daughter or niece or somebody and that they were in the family house and they went into the bedroom and that Coppola had a stack of my comic books on his bedside table. Wow. And then uh, after he launched that magazine, uh, Zotrope All Story, right. he I was one of the first guest editors on that back when, oh, it, was I didn't a, know back that. when it was a tabloid, yeah. Guest okay, editor didn't... slash designer. So I did one of those things and then I figured there was no pay for it. So I figured this now he owes me a favor. Right. And so when Cash the time came to get a blurb for my book, I asked him to do it and he uh, he did it. Nice. That's amazing. Yeah, super nice. That's super nice. And how long did this uh, new book take you, start to finish? Start to finish? 
took me about five months, but there were a few interruptions in there. There were right. a few other jobs that I did. Right. Jim, I, I meant to ask you, uh, something that always intrigues me about artists that we have on and filmmakers is creating. What do you use? What are the tools you use? Are you using, you know, pitographs? Are you using Sharpies? I mean, I, you know, I'm, an, I'm a moron. Educate me. Well, that's a tall order. <laughs> I draw on Bristol board, and I pencil it out, and then I ink it with uh, dip pens, steel dip pens. You know the kind? Yep. Split metal pens, you dip them yep. in ink, and they make lines. Yep. <laughs> and uh, actually, I'm in the process of having a six-foot tall pen and pen holder made so that I can make giant pen and ink drawings. Really? Yeah, except that there's a problem of, uh, I guess it's molecular scale, because the ink is is cohesive enough to work on a piece Small. of paper with a nib, but when you're trying to make a line that's half an inch wide... It's going to run. Yeah, it? the surface tension just isn't there, so I'm developing baffles underneath it that will spread with the point so that I can uh, actually make this thing function. But when it happens, it will be a unique thing. You know, there have been large brushes that people have used for huge Sumier paintings and that sort right. of thing. I don't think anybody's ever made a giant nib. And who's making the nibs for you? I'm having it made by a metal fabricator in Seattle where uh -huh. I live. Right. He's already made one test model that's worked pretty good. And, and well, how, wide, how wide is it's the It's about this tip. long. and the, Well, the tip is about an eighth of an inch wide. Right. And it's rounded right. so that... So uh, it can hold the ink. Yeah, and so you don't get a calligraphy chisel point. Right. Now, when you're, hold, you're holding with two, I mean, how big is the, 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 uh, the barrel of it? Well, it's like a, if you imagine a regular pen and ink holder that's this tall, it's like that. Wow. So I've, I've made a mock-up of one out of cardboard, and you hold the, the, the cork part here right. like this, and you hold the other part under your arm. You put this hand behind your back, and you go like that. That's great. It's really hard. <laughs> I would imagine It takes a so. tremendous amount of pressure to make those tines split. And will you, will, what will be the purpose of this ultimately? So you'll have gallery pieces? Well, so I'll have this great artifact, this giant pen, and then I will give public demonstrations about them because, you know, people don't use dip pens so much right. anymore. Right. And I, uh, I think that's a bad thing. I don't think that technology should be swallowed up by the sands of time. So I'm sort of doing it just to promote the whole concept of dip pens. And, uh, are you doing a pencil sketch first before you do the dip pen? Yeah, yeah. It's and all... then you, you erase the uh, pencil lines? Yeah, Right. or partially erase it. I like to leave a little pencil showing. There's probably a little showing through in every one of these These are things. the original panels? Yeah, these are the original pages. Pages, right. See, there's a little bit of pencil showing through right there. Right, it's fantastic. And how long, would, how long for, in, for instance, did this piece take you to, to render? Oh, this page probably took me one long day to do from, say, uh, 7 in the morning to 5 or 6 in the evening. Wow. That's fantastic. Something like that. I love that. Great answer. When you're drawing, do you listen to music or anything? I listen to spoken word. Really? Yeah. I listen to old radio shows. I listen to books on tape. And if I find a book I really like, I listen to it over and over and over again. You know, it's funny because I look at it and go, oh, he must be listening to Captain Beefheart or some psychedelic oh, yeah. music. Well, you I know? did listen to Captain Beefheart. You know, it's funny what each person brings away. This is very, very helpful. Now we know what to send you to maybe inspire you for your next. Yeah, sure, by all means. <laughs> you know, the, the kind of second string old radio shows uh, that were brought into being to compete with the successful ones, like the really cheap imitations of Suspense right. or uh, Quiet Please, you know, it's right. like. When those shows started making money, they went to the sanitariums and pulled out all the alcoholic writers and metal cases to produce these stories for radio. Really? And some of them are just incredibly bizarre and, and frightening in ways they were not intended to be. I had no idea. Where do you pick these up? Oh, they're all online. There's huge archives of old really? radio shows online. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. An and inexhaustible treasure trove. Well, Jim, I wanted to thank you for being on our show. Continue success. Thank you very much. And, and thanks for coming down here. Weathercraft. I highly recommend this. Look, it's a free commercial. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and you did a beautiful job. Thank you. Oh, thank you.